and then you're on. So um, Nate Kwanza is the academic director of the School for International Training in Madagascar. He's a botanist by training and an ethnobotanist by profession. Uh, Dr. Kwanza has a PhD from the University of London Goldsmiths College and an MS in botany, a BS honors and a diploma in education from the University of Cape Coast, Ghana. Um, Dr. Kwanza researches, advises, and lectures on a wide range of topics, including sustainable resource use, rural development, integrated healthcare, traditional medicine, biological and cultural diversity, conservation. Um, he was awarded the prestigious Goldman Environmental Prize. Um, Jay, Jay Godsell, he was the founder and CEO of a company called SolarShip. He's, I think, might be speaking to us from Toronto, but he seems to travel all over the world. Um, he has developed um, hybrid aircraft to deliver critical cargo to cut off places like most of South Asia or Africa um, that doesn't have a well-developed road network, et cetera. The solar ship gains lift from, um, a, uh, from both buoyant gas and high aerodynamics and uses uh, power from solar panels. The aircraft is a new concept to transport that does not rely on fossil fuel or ground infrastructure. Um, I hope we get a chance to hear a little bit about that eventually um, in your talk. Okay, Nat and Jay, you're on and I'm off. And you'll have to unmute yourself, uh, Nat. You're 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 muted, as is Jay, and Jay is now uh, hearable. And Jawaria, can you unmute uh, Nat? I have, yeah, but um, I've asked him to unmute, but he's going to have to accept to. Okay, there we go. Yep. Yep. Thank you, Meda. Thank you for the introduction. And I'm glad that we are able to be able to be part of this. Our, our electrical system just popped up some 15 minutes ago. So uh, I'm glad to be here. Um, and thank you, Brother Jay. Um, our plan is I'm going to do the presentation and then during the um, uh, session, Jay will chip in and we'll have a, during the question time that he'll come up with more of the information about the solar ship systems and things. So that is how we're going to go about it. Well, um, good, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, good night, everyone, wherever you are. Um, sustainable development program getting communities involved. That's what we're going to talk about. Nat, we just, we lost your verbal, the uh, sound for a, a short moment there. Um, you can hear me now? I can hear you now, yeah. Okay, right. So, I said sustainable development program, getting communities involved. And understanding an issue is a prerequisite to finding appropriate solution to that issue. If, and only if we want the issue resolved. Human beings, we are individuals and social, independent and simultaneously dependent. However, helping to make other humans become totally dependent on anything, including on other human beings, is not ethical nor good. Because total dependency equates to addiction, and addiction is not good for anyone's health. That's how we see it, and that's how we hope things will be. And we all need a hope, every creature, organism including humans settles at a place in an environment where it adapts to survive and live and that place becomes the habitat of that creature habitat is a place where an organism makes its home 
And the main components of a habitat are shelter, water, food, and space. And a habitat is said to have a suitable arrangement when it has the correct amount of all components, even though it's not always that a habitat needs all the components of a suitable arrangement. We've coined up this word, habit art, from the habitat, because the occupants of a habitat must develop a habit at doing things that enables them to survive in that place. And a habit is an acquired mode of behavior that has become nearly or com uh, completely involuntary. So when one is able to live at the place and survive there, that individual would have developed the habit at doing things that enables that individual to survive at that place. And we see a habitat as a place where a creature lives because that creature has developed the ability to have having a habit at doing things and perfected the ways of living and surviving in that area. That is how we see a habitat to be, having developed the habit of doing things and perfected things, the ways of living and surviving in that area. That becomes a habitat. And a community arises when various creatures come to settle at a common place, having developed the habit at doing things which enables them to survive and live in that area. Anything, be it positive or negative, that comes to disrupt how this habit at doing things by the community, within the community, can then be deemed as a development program. And development denotes transformation, and transformation means change. Whether to effect change, which is creating new changes, or affecting change, influencing or modifying changes that is already in existence. One then has to ask, is the development one that effects and brings about new habits at doing things? Or is it one that is going to influence and modify an already existing habit at doing things? Is it internally driven or is externally driven? Is it one where the identified need, which should be and is the basis of the development program emanating from the community, or is one that the identified need is perceived and brought in from the outside? It's important that one gets to get that idea or clarify that situation before one embarks on the development program. And basically, there are two main development programs that are at play at the moment, community-led development and community-driven development. Community-led development being the development approach in which local community members work together to identify goals that are important to them, develop and implement plans to achieve those goals and create collaborative relationships internally and externally with outside actors. And the community driven one is the approach where the community is given, it's like delegating the responsibility or the means to develop the area to the community. And one wants to, has to understand that development leads to change and change has consequences. And therefore to embark on any development program, one needs to get to know the consequences. And getting to know the consequences requires understanding what the rate of change, 
and the carrying capacity of the people in their area are. What is the rate of change? It's often used when speaking about momentum and generally expressed as a ratio between a change in one var variable relative to a corresponding change in another. We are considering rate of change here as the speed and the time frame, that's the duration that which enables community or people to be able to reset their habit at, that is vis-a-vis -vis the transformation, the changes that are going to be affected in their area come the development activity. Carrying capacity. This is an ecological concept whose use is usually with reference to numbers and environment, numbers of individuals, of organisms that can be supported in a given environment. And here in 2006, defined carrying capacity as the environment's maximal load. We are considering carrying capacity here as a people and their area's ability to cope with the exigencies and adjustments to be brought in or being brought in by the development transformation. They appropriate and incorporate these into their way of life. And when a rate of change is beyond the carrying capacity, that is too fast a momentum too little time for adjustment, the result is a disaster. One can equate, I mean, because people in their area will not be able to cope and adapt. And then and a typical example is every day we have the wind blowing and we are happy because it's within the carrying capacity of the environment. Once the carrying, the, the rate of change and the carrying capacity is over, a hurricane force wind is beyond the carrying capacity of the environment. And what do we see? Disaster. Once a hurricane force, a cyclone, a tornado comes through a place, it leaves behind disaster. And it's the same thing. The change that the development is bringing in, if it, one doesn't take into account the ability of the community to receive it, and that appropriate and adapt. It goes beyond the carrying capacity of the people and their environment and their area is going to spell disaster. But when the rate of change is within the carrying capacity, that is we have the appropriate momentum, enough time for adjustment and to adapt, the result is beneficial and positive. We want to look at a couple of what we call the key to successfully getting community involved in a development program. One has to know and understand the people nature relationship. How will the development affect the community's relationship with their natural environment? Will it improve or destroy their relationship with the natural environment? Their natural environment is very, very important. One has to also consider the socioeconomic health linkage. What is the economic consequence on their lives, of the community's members' lives? Would, it, would they be better off or worse off economically? How does that affect the social environment? Because as I said, communities or humans, we are individuals, but at the same time, we are social. The community arises, they are social. Will the arrival of the development program unite them or we end up having a, a disintegrated community? How does this affect their health? Is the activity coming in, whether it be it from the community themselves or coming from outside, how does that relate to their health? Will they be healthier or their health is going to be degenerate and they become unhealthy. The third thing is one needs to allot adequate time for the community members to develop the habit at 
doing things with respect to the impending or intending consequence of the development program that is coming in there. And how do we get them involved? The first thing is engage them, engage the community, build trust, be trustworthy. To build trust and be trustworthy, you got to be honest, be honest with them. If you are coming in, let them know why you are there, engage them and allow them, be humble. That is very, very important. Don't develop chips on your shoulders. If you develop chips, the chips will be broken and that doesn't spell anything good. And allow them to take up their responsibility. That is very, very important. Oftentimes we are in a hurry and we think, oh, okay, if they don't do it, we will do it for them. No, allow them to take up their responsibility. If you don't allow them to take up their responsibility, you will end up being blackmailed because they will say, oh, we won't do it. We won't take part, we won't participate, we won't do A, B, C, because you don't allow them to take up their responsibility. Allow them to take up their responsibility. And listen to the community members. It is in listening that we hear, in hearing that we know, and in knowing that we understand. This is crucial. We need to listen. Listen to the community. Take time to listen to them in order to understand their needs and see their needs from their perspective, not from your perspective. It's very, very important. That's one we say, wear their shoes. If they don't have shoes, take off your shoes and wear barefoot. And you'll realize how nice it is or how difficult it is to be walking around in that environment. So when you're going in, understand the community dynamics. How do things operate within the community? Get to know the community structure, the norms and taboos, community cohesiveness or otherwise. Are they united? They work, they do things. In which way do they do things? Get to understand that. And once you understand, it's very, very important. And one important thing, eschew the eagerness of the wanting to help the people mentality and attitude. Developers, developments, whichever action we want to take, we've got to acknowledge, recognize, and accept the capabilities of communities to contribute to the development of their own area. And that is where understanding and getting them take up their responsibility is very, very important. On that note, I'll say proponents of trans transformation to be brought about in any community must themselves be transformed first in terms of attitude and mentality towards the communities that they envisage to help transform. It's very, very important. The humility aspect, the honesty aspect, getting them involved and allowing them to take up their responsibility is very, very important. And if we change our own mentality first, that they are capable, then it's going to make life easy for everybody. We should act sustainability, that is, Consider yourself in the context of partnership. The people should feel and know that what is being done there in their area is theirs, not yours. Very, very crucial. If it's yours, that's when they might end up blackmailing you. Because if they don't do it, it's you who is in trouble. But if it's theirs, everybody takes care of the things that are theirs. To act sustainability, you act to complement, reinforce their capacity, or help build their capacity if it doesn't exist already. And your presence there should be supportive and complementary. That is very, very important. And we see sustainability as a people are able to 
adapt to the exigencies and adjustments required or being brought in by the development and are able to incorporate this in their way of life, continue to carry out the process or processes of the development with a minimum or no external input when the program partner is no more there. If when the program partner is no more there and the program grinds to a halt, that is not sustainable development. And then the sustainability again shows that the community members are able to maintain the structures that have been brought in by the development program. Remember, development brings in change. So things come in, they got to learn to adapt and they should be able to maintain the structures that have been brought in by the development program. And whichever type of development program that once is envisioned should not alienate community members. We should ensure that community members appropriate, they own the development and the community members are able to manage and continue to reap the beneficial aspects of the development that comes in there. When that should happen, that is what we will say a sustainable development program has been either implemented, started from the community or brought in from outside, but it's been appropriated by the community. Yet I want to we sought Asanteni, Ngiabonga, Obrigado, Messi, and thank you. Thank you. And th thank you, uh, Nat. And um, that was uh, wonderful, powerful, informative, um, and we're thrilled to have gotten all of that from you. Um, this is now the, the way we have been doing questions and dialogue in for the other speakers has been they have um, put their question in uh, the chat. Um, room and um, then I've, you know, sometimes there's a lot, sometimes there's uh, overlap and I have, uh, uh, you know, not edited them, but picked the ones that had the least overlap and asked you. So we can start that, but it might also, um, I have a question about um, how, well, let me, let me not go into my question. Let me, let me deal with, um, what's there, the first question that's come up is what habits support community led? How should leadership work? That's the first question that I see here. So if, if you wanna to respond to that, um, we can go forward and both of you are welcome to respond. But um, the next question will de deal with uh, Jay and uh, his, his work, but that's the first one here. Go ahead, Nat. Okay. What habits support community led? For the, the ability to live and survive in an area already is you have to have developed the habit at doing things that fit that environment. So be it getting their water, their houses, energy, resource use, whichever way that enables them to survive in that area is a habit that they've developed. And, 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 and that habit, whether from within or from outside, a develop a program, an activity, that would disrupt that habit is a development activity. And therefore that should take into consideration the way the people behave, live and survive in that environment. That is the habit that I will, I will, I will, I will talk about. And the role of leadership is within the community again, 
how does that community structure operate? It's very, very important. Every community is like a home. Each one of us in our homes, we have a structure. And that structure should be looked at and understood. So whoever is the leader, whichever form of leadership style that the community uses to do their things should be taken into account and complemented if the word is correct for them to be able to continue to survive in the environment that they've uh, the habitat that they've created for themselves thank you um there's somebody who's saying you know they found your definition of habitat um, absolutely fascinating and was wondering how did you come up with this definition? What kind of observations did you need to see that helped you form this definition? That is, how did you come up with it? They're asking for the secrets of your creative process here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I sometimes I say sleep over things. I, I, I see words, I get their definitions, I get their meanings, and then I look at them. And another, another word that um, I've, it, it's not, it doesn't appear here, but in alternatives, for example, alternatives. You look at it critically, it's alternatives, which is not great. <laughs> So, so habitat, looking at habitat, I'm a, an ethnobotanist, I'm a botanist, so I, I know what habitats are in uh, the environments that I work. And looking, once I've been in the field, looking at how the creatures behave within those habitats, and then transposing that into the human community, how we behave in the different places that we live, said we've developed a way of doing things that is the habit at doing things in the environment that we find ourselves in the habitat that we've created for ourselves so that is how i i i i, I try and sort of dissect the words that are there and that is when i've done that and i sleep over them then the meanings come over uh, that is, that's a little of the secret that I, I go about. So I say in, in the coconut, once you sleep over it, then the coconut chains and then things come into shape. That is, that is how I came about with that definition. Have it at observing creatures behave in the environment that they are. It's, it's, they've perfected certain ways of doing things to survive in that area. They have the habit at doing the things in that habitat. So an interesting question is, what's the role of leadership in all of this? Uh, somebody asked that. Um, I'm curious what your response will be. It's not to come in and take over, but it seems like from what you're saying, it's coming in to cultivate a uh, process that uh, puts the community in the leadership position. I, I don't know if that's, I don't wanna put words in your mouth, but that seems to be what I'm hearing. It's not the community as it is works in a certain way. That's why understanding the community structure is very, very important. The dynamics is more important. Understanding the community dynamics is very, very important. So every community have their structure. Leadership is part of it. And when, where the community is well united, you will be surprised to see how the leaders and the, if I'll use in quotes, the ordinary people, how they relate to each other. Communication is very, very important in that instance. And the leadership, leadership usually is not just one person, it's a team of people working together. But 
it spreads out each family, each family member, each individual. The diff so understanding the community dynamics, that is the starting point of the whole thing. So whichever leadership style that they have, that should be taken into account as if this, the, the, the development activity is externally based, going in, you got to think of that. If it's coming from inside, you go to, and you are coming in to be a partner, that as well, you got to understand. So understanding the community dynamics is very, very important. The leadership, it depends on the leadership style that the community themselves have put in place. That's understanding that will enable you to go about the work that needs to be done and done properly. So um, there's two things going on right now, um, at least two, there's probably 2000, but in this particular conversation, one is, is um, there's a lot of questions that have come up in response to your talk, Nat. But um, we also want to hear from Jay a little bit about um, his, uh, why he's there, you know, why you wanted him there. It was for a very good reason, and he's got a lot to say. So um, I want to proceed and honor the people who are asking these wonderful, important questions, but I also want to respect Jay and his presence there. You, you, you wanted him there for, you know, very good reason. So, um, one of the things we can do is just make a short segue over to Jay and ask him to uh, deal with what it is you want, why you wanted him there, you know, whether it was to comment on this or to add to it, to bring his perspective and experience and wisdom to bear on all of this. So um, for a moment, let's segue over to Jay and ask him for his um, views on stuff and then we can come back to the questions. Sure. Did you did you want me to jump in and say something, or did you want me? To, I mean, maybe not. You can set me up, but um, I'm 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 I mean I'm 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 of the Nat Kwanzaa school, so I think you know when when I'm listening to him speak, there's very much a, a bottom up approach to communities and development. And I think what Nelson Mandela said when he came out of prison, he learned uh, leadership from herding goats because his job as a very young child was herding goats. The strong will lead the herd forward. They just, in it, you know, there's, we all have our different dynamics in different cultures, but strong will pull the, the herd forward. And it was his job to observe, you know, the peripheries and try and make sure that things were going in the right direction. You don't get hit by a vehicle, there's no leopard or something like that. So I think about this, the, the question coming in from Solomo, uh, how can African leaders listen to communities and help them develop instead of dictating? I'm just going to try and smash them together a little bit, Medard, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll try and bring the two themes together. <laughs> I think, you know, if you, if you look at what I do right now with solar powered airships, they're very simple things. If you put enough buoyant gas in a bag and the bag doesn't leak, it will go up. If you put a large enough solar panel on it and you plug in the motors, it will go forward as long as there's not a lot of wind blowing it back. So what I do is really simple. If you make a huge one, coming back to Nat's you know, presentation, you can really disrupt things and you can come in and really be disruptive. And in North America, the disruptive entrepreneur is supposed to be such a great hero, but you can really mess things up because the carrying capacity of local people to be hit with a new thing, especially technically, is often, you know, who's the judge of disrupting to the positive or to the negative? And, you know, think, I mean, I think back to visiting Nat's integrated clinics where you take a medical student and a traditional healer, you put them in the same clinic. This is a way of having the modern and postmodern technical world come in and work peer to peer with local expertise. So if you think about an airship, the more you put into an airship bag of lift, the more you could lift and the bigger the lift and you can, you can lift a lot of payload, you can lift a lot of people, you can lift a lot of batteries and you can really change things probably too fast. A bottom-up approach would say, how small can we make them? Could we go to Northwestern Madagascar and have a little bit of almost like a football soccer tournament where we say, okay, we're gonna bring a bunch of kids in to see who's good at piloting. And now we're gonna do a little race. Who can pick up critical supplies? Like maybe it's traditional Raukandro medicine from Northwestern Madagascar and who can deliver them? 
a little bit of a race where it's a logistics competition because then you would be introducing the same technology with the same properties, but small. And now you're having the little girl from over there race against maybe the captain of the soccer team over there. You can, you can engage a community bottom up by making things small enough that that doesn't swamp them. It doesn't overload them. Then they can start to comment on by playing the game of playing with your technology. They will do things with the technology that you won't think of. And this is honoring the community. And sometimes you'll see leaders come forward out of the crowd who might not be A-listed from a, you know, certain families and communities or, you know, you, who, you're the daughter of so-and-so, oh, we better pay attention to you. But you can get some wild cards coming out with this bottom up approach and they can then start to play with your technology, which is a way, and I just think from the technical disruptive point of view around community development, let them play with it, let them comment on it. And I would propose, let them compete in different teams with it, make it fun. So that the conversation now becomes about, yes, features and benefits and performance of this new thing, but it's also a way of creating a round table so that after you, you, you kind of game them a little bit after um, doing something um, that was fun, but also if they get a chance and, and, and you know, if Nat had a lot more time, he'd have a lot more examples. You know, it's one of those things, Nat's got a lot of examples of how this works, but, what is critical supply to one community, even Malawi versus you know, Burundi versus Madagascar could be totally different about what they want you to lift. I'm just coming back to airships and simplicity, but if, if 10 kilos of something was really critical somewhere, somebody else might not agree that that's a critical supply. So getting them to own the content, set the stage and then say, okay, I would just say one way to do this is to make it a game, play with them, uh, mix teams up, and that way the conversation about what will be de developed, which could be a much bigger thing, like the internet or a certain type of electricity or a certain type of transport system, by playing with them early and letting them own the content and drive the discussion, I would say that's akin to being like little Nelson Mandela herding goats, where the strong are now pulling the te pulling the community to develop in a certain way, and you get to have a discussion later. And you're, you know, you're rarely punished for listening. Um, so a big part of it is you can be a more active listener if you activate the discussion. And I think of a really big thing is organizing ways to, to activate the discussion by getting people to play with new technologies and new ideas. Thank you. Uh, both of you. Um, that, um, your talks have filled with um, wisdom and, and profound insights. Um, I'm going to segue back to some of the questions. They they have I think take off from what you're at what you just presented, both of you. Um, but um, this is um, one of the questions in your work. Is there a habitat or community that you found difficult to build trust with, and then? Related to that question is another one, you know, how can African leaders listen to communities and help them develop instead of dictating? Um, are there some examples of progress and leadership in understanding such dynamics? Now, they're sort of related. Sorry if they're, they're you know, too far apart, but um, I saw them as somewhat related. If you could, one or both of you could respond in some way um, how that you could, uh, you know, in your work, is there a habitat or community that you found difficult to build trust with? And then how can you move uh, forward in that? Building trust. I mean, trust is something that is very, very easily built, but even easily, more easily destroyed. It only takes a clip like that. And you, you break that trust. Trust is like having a bucket full of water. You handle it with care. But you poke the base of that bucket, the water is no more going to stay in that bucket. And you've lost that trust. That's it. You're not going to be able to pick the water from the ground once you've spilled it. 
how do you get communities to trust you? Be honest. I've worked with people or taking people to communities and you cannot, you cannot hide not being honest. You cannot hide this honesty um, forever. <laughs> if you came in pretending, truth is like a cork. The only way you can still push truth and in the bucket of water with that is surface is to have your hand also holding that truth, that cork and in the water. Everybody's going to ask you, why is your hand always in that water? Take your hand out. You take your hand out, the cork pops up. That's being honest. Just tell them exactly what you are there for. I think somebody was saying, how do you get communities to, to trust? It's a two-way thing. Building trust is a two-way thing. Be honest with what you are there for. People have gone in into communities. You don't want to mention names, but pretending to do something for the community, whereas in the real sense of the word, they are there for their own interest. Let the community's interest be your interest. Let, I can see something here that communities are conservative and don't accept the idea of change from external forces. What change, what, what do you mean by that change from the external force? They have developed the habit at doing things in their environment to enable them survive in that environment. If the change which is disruptive is coming in, is that disruption going to be positive or negative? If it's going to be negative, nobody is going to tolerate a negative consequence. If it's going to be positive, yep. So it, it all depends on what you mean by, is that change positive for the community? Is, are you seeing the thing in their eyes, with their eyes, or you are seeing it with your own eyes and you are saying this is the change that should take place there? Is it a change that fits the carrying capacity? Is it a change that enables them to continue to survive in that area and do the things that they've able to do with that add to it to make it better? But even again, even talking about the better, who's better? That's the question. So things need to be looked at the perspective. As I mentioned in the presentation, think of the people nature relationship. Think of the consequence of whichever disruption that is. Is it positive? Is it negative? Will the community be able to appropriate it and continue with it, have a beneficial effect? If it will have a beneficial effect, they will appropriate it. And you work with them as a partner, but not as the Lord. I mean, somebody is in with them, uh, dictators coming in. No, no, things understand the community dynamics. And that is how we, and most often too, you need to start small. The micros are as important, if not more important as the macros. Oftentimes the macro is not the sum of the micros. If you put the micros together, you end up getting a, a broader macro, but we forget the micros and we're looking at the macro. JFK said, a journey of a thousand miles starts with the first foot step. That's the micro. You want to build a house, you got to start with a foundation. Let the, so you are sitting at the far 100 kilometers away and you see a huge river. It started small. 
So it's very, very important that humans will start understanding the importance of the, of the minimum, of the smallness. And the smallness then will complement each other. The whole becomes, is, is, is parts, parts that come together to become the whole. So if I could just jump in on uh, uh, and then continue in that with, you know, conservatism, trust. I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a famous astronaut in Canada that talks about fear versus danger and being an astronaut is extremely dangerous. Um, but a lot of people are afraid of things. And so you think about trust, you, a lot of people, especially, you know, outside forces coming into traditional societies want to be trusted because they want to introduce something. And they want to do something, but they don't often, you know, build the time to be trusted. So I think the big thing with trust is you can trust me to be me if I expose me. I can't be Nat. Um, I can try to be Nat. I can talk sugar sweet to you about how Nat I am, but I'm not Nat. You know, he's good looking and smart. I'm bad tempered and don't have a good memory for these things. So, so, but you can trust me to be me. You pour boiling water over those tea bags. The tea bags don't lie, right? They will show you their true colors. You want boiling water over the tea bags. You don't want cold water over the tea bags. You're looking, Canadians are looking for opportunities for snow so they can show their neighbors that I'm going to go shovel some snow for you. I want a foot of snow because it shows I'm a good neighbor. So the trust is a bit like an immune system. Your immune system will be tested anytime you bring two communities together to do something. The, you, there will be infectious agents. You're gonna displace someone who gets jealous. You, you need to build up an immune system to be yourself. You need to tell people why you're coming in. Why are you here? You know, you've come a long way. Why are you here? So if you, if you talk sugar sweet with me, I think you're gonna be smiling with your front teeth and chewing with your back teeth. Show me what you're doing. And so, so that you can build your immune system up for mistake because you will make mistakes. And if they trust you to be a mistake maker, but a mistake corrector, okay. They're, now you're starting to build an immune system. And then you start to separate fear and danger by showing people you're afraid of the unknown. I'm going to try and get you to know. And then danger. Are you reducing danger? Because conservative places are conservative for a reason. Bad things happen. When if bad things have happened when they tried things, you go to a place with a high death rate, you're going to find conservative people. And, and so think of something like the road and the car. It's probably the biggest destroyer of nature, human lives, animals like the road is something everybody wants. And it's a big change, but it kills a lot of people. You know, look at Canada and ice um, and snow. I mean, it kills a lot of people, but everybody wants a road. So conservative places adopt it. They're very dangerous things to have, but people have adopted the danger because they see the benefits. Back to what Nat's saying. You have to show who you are, expose the, the, you know, your motivations and, and, and the downside of who you are, but you have to have some objectives that you talk about, and then you got to show some results. And some of those results won't be as promised. Okay, can you own them? And, can, and, and I think back to playing with communities in a way that, that, that says we're going to try and play with this thing together, you then there's ideally you're creating these cross-cultural teams where people start to let down, you know, they let down their guard and they start to, by, by showing trust, you know, Nat is a phenomenal soccer player, football player. And, and, and you know, in, in Canadian terms, you don't ask for the ice hockey puck first, you pass it first. So by, by giving people authority, giving them the chance to lead in a certain way, you know, you can start to build up trust that this person's a giver, this person's a listener, then you don't get results. Something, something will happen that is not according to plan. That's when you've got your opportunity to build trust. How do you deal with that? Because it's coming. Thank you. One question related to that, um, Zula asked, um, you know, in your work, is there a habitat or community that you found difficult to build trust with? And I'll add, you know, why? What was going on under the surface that might have led to that difficulty? There is always going to be, if you're coming in, and that is very important, you, you are an, an outsider. Mm -hmm. For you to be able to, you got to be who you are. And as Jay said, let them know why you are there. 
in their interest or in your own interest. I mean, don't, don't pretend. Don't ever pretend. And don't, don't promise something huge just to captivate them. No. Be you. Explain why you are there. If you are there as a partner, you, you've seen them doing something and you think you can complement to make it even work good for them because you are not going to be there. At the end of the day, whatever is being done there, the effect of it is on them first. I remember I, I, I was in one place, diplomacy sake, I won't mention names that a community were prepared to burn their forest because the organization responsible for helping to conserve that area were promising things that they were not delivering. Don't do that. But I ask one question to the community members, whose forest is this? The first time I asked that, they pointed to the organization's staff. I asked again, whose forest is this that you want to print? So they said, there's. There was an elderly man there. He was 76 years old at that time. I asked him with all due respect, how long have you been here? He said, I was born and bred here and I've lived here and I'm 76. How often do the staff come here? And when they come, how long do they stay? Oh, they come here three or four times in the year. And each time they come, they stay a maximum of one week. I say, I'll take the maximum. So in the year, they come for a month. And you've lived here 76 years. Whose forest is that? Now they started shaking their head. They didn't point finger to the staff again. If you burn that forest, it's you who suffers first. It's not them who are coming in. Coming in, as we say, tourism and immigration is not the same thing. Tourism, you're only there for two, three days, four months, one month maximum. You enjoy the sun and the snow or whatever it is, and then you go back. But if you're living there, that's when you get to see the reality of the situation. So, as I mentioned in there, we should eschew that mentality, that attitude that they don't want change. What do you mean they don't want change? Nobody wants change if the change is going to disrupt in a negative way. And even when it's positive, people still want to smell it a little bit step by step, little by little. It, I mean, change doesn't, it's, it's, change doesn't happen just like that, unless it's a miraculous change. But it's a step by step. It's a process. If you understand that, it's a process. And processes just don't get up and that. It starts and it moves on and it adapts according to us, we move forward. Sometimes you got to stop and then rethink, analyze, and see how things could go forward or sometimes move to move back, retreat, and see how are things going. That is how you do things. You work with the community, building the trust. It, it, takes, it's, it doesn't take a lot of things to build a trust with the community, but it takes just something little like that to break that trust. And once that trust is broken, boy, you are in a deep trouble because nobody is going to listen anymore. That is the whole thing. You're in deep trouble. And also the next person who comes along is in deep trouble because you've yes. created the depth of the trouble. So, yep. so a big thing with you know, difficult communities is someone has come before you and destroyed yep. the trust. And sometimes you know, I don't look like Nat. Nat doesn't look like me. So if someone came before who looks like Nat, they're prejudged and you people are bad. And often, you know, 
I mean, I think Martin Luther King's main point was you can judge me after I'm born on what I do. Don't judge me before I'm born because then you don't give me a chance. But you'll go into a place and people will be prejudiced because something bad happened before you got there. And this is an opportunity to bring that out in the conversation. Um, because otherwise, if you don't know the history of what came before you, you could start saying things unwittingly to trigger something. You could start doing things. You could, there's a bunch of things that happen. And so often you need a translator who knows the history, who is willing to tell you, okay, this is what happened before, you know, people like you or not, you know, this is, this is not an asset. Sorry. You know, certain people with the Arctic blonde look, my dark, you know, we don't actually, okay, that's not an asset here. No, it's an asset upstairs in this hotel, this conference. That's not an asset over there. Okay. That's good. It's good to do one's homework on what came before you. It's now um, three o'clock after what my clock says one after three and i definitely don't want to trespass on your time ned and jay <clears throat> but i do want to listen more and more um and so i really um need to let you make the decision that you um, can go on for another 15 minutes okay i am open to that um there there is um a you know continue set of questions, one of which um, has to do is, you know, asked early on was, you know, what's the, what should be the role of leadership in, in these communities? If you're going in um, the model you're using, you know, to bring about some change, some change that fits in with the community's own sensibilities, uh, what's the role of the leadership in this? The question is, which leadership? Is it the structural that, let's say, the chief, queen, elder states, men, women, is that what we're talking about? Leadership and a good leader will is the one who harness or mobilize his or her people for them to work in a complementary manner in the interest of the good of the community. That is the leader. That is the leader. And sometimes, sometimes the leader is not the one that you see sitting on that chair. The leader is hiding quietly and doing things through the one that you are seeing there. So understanding the community dynamics is very, very important. That is that person sitting there that you think is the leader? Is that the leader? Or is just a figure, a figurehead that we've put the, the community have put that person there to show the rest of the world that this is our leader, but is not the real leader. There's others that are doing, I mean, mobilizing and making the community operate in a cohesive manner, that will be the leader. So leadership, as Jay said, get to know the history of the place. I will put it, get to understand the community dynamics. Who is the leader? What sort of leadership that they have? Is it an individual as the leader or is a team? That is very, very important. That is very, very important. And a real good leader, I would always say, is one who works in a team and complements others. So that's the role that the leader will play. The leader will mobilize his or her people. They will work to complement each other. The, leader, the, leaders, the leaders have a role to play. In any case, change comes in it doesn't everybody, not everybody is going to accept it if you are bringing it from outside. Not everybody is going to accept it at the word go. Some people will play the wait and see first. They will sit on the fence. Some people will even be the, the other disruption of the disruption that is coming in. <laughs> you bring it, what you are bringing in is, is a disruption. They will try to disrupt that as well. So, it's very, very important to get to understand the community dynamics. That is very, very important. How things operate at that place is very important. 
Jay, I have a <clears throat> question for you. Your change is, to say the least, radical. You know, there aren't any uh, flying machines, let's say, in rural Africa. It meets a vital need of getting important stuff from one place to another, but it, um, there's no precedence. You know, there, it's not a roadway that you're in need of. Um, how do you deal with um, that situation? I mean, you're, you're showing up with a radical change, I think, it, although it's bringing in, uh, you know, needed goods, services, whatever, but have, how, how does that show up in, in your world to bring about uh, the change and acceptance with such a radical, different way of, of moving things about? Well, I think there are a couple of things, or probably three things to think about. One is, <clears throat> I remember going with Nat into Northwestern Madagascar, and at the time I was in the peak you know, uh, physical condition of my life. And um, so we met these kids to bring the knapsacks into, it's a very, it's a mountain climb. Um, and, and so the, the transport system, and this is really a big thing about transport system. It's a very short distance as the crow flies, but it was a long, long marathon <laughs> through a lot of uphill mountains. And so I didn't want Nat to hire some kids who physically I thought were I was on par with. And he said, no, you have to let them carry your knapsack because we need to circulate the benefits of us being here. I don't want my reputation to be a guy who everybody carries. I'm like, that's what they do. They're transporters, porters, transporters. They will carry your knapsack. So one pillar of this is how do you come in when you disrupt with radical change? Um, how do you allow the change to circulate in amongst local players who are already playing the game of moving things. You're coming to displace them or you're coming to include them. They're gonna wanna know. Because if you, if you wanna test to see if bullets will bring down an airship, displace them. Say we're gonna run you out of business. Okay, why would you run me out of business? Like why are you, want, what kind of human being are you? So how do you include them in the process of the change? Because otherwise they will very likely try to block your way. And, and, and some would say they probably should. So that's one. The second part of it is, um, how do you do things at a scale that people can digest? You know, so if you bring in massive radical change, you can really freak people out and not everybody's going, so people will fear your intentions because you're now showing something that is, you know, powerful, but power is dangerous. Power can, can hurt people. Then you get, you know, what they say in Burundi would be radio trottoir. The, the, the rumor mill will start working against you. And it doesn't take much. You think like social media has been around a long time. It just wasn't digital. So you can get character assassination that your intentions are evil and you, you're actually here to do a whole bunch of harm because there are no owners of your narrative who share, who are on your team with the same, with the same color shirt, right? So, so how do you engage people? And it's okay to have debate. It's okay to locally, they don't like each other. They kicked each other in the shins in the last uh, soccer tournament, no problem there. So there are lots of people competing, but how do you enable enough people to adopt the technology? And we would say, make them small, have little tournaments where people get to try them. Um, and, and people get to own and demystify the relationship with, this, with, the, with the technology and also take the technology apart, let people see it because there's always maintenance, repair and overhaul on something. Take the cell phone with no schools for cell phone repair, whoosh, people were fixing cell phones all over the place. Go into an African town and look at the creativity for fixing cars. So you want to include people early and um, and then reduce the amount. The temptation is to say it's going to be revolutionary. It's going to be disruptive. It's like take it, take it down a notch. Make it feel normal. You know, you can see sometimes. I watch, and 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 and, and I, you know, in especially Africa, our favorite place. You know, for this kind of thing, it's a very young place, youth culture, and people are a lot of young people are open to ideas, but they also are eager to. Kind of fall in love with a career and, and like be involved in something so finding out individually communities are not faceless people they have some people who who would love to be in a race with something some people love to tinker in you know change things there's a real passion there so how do you start to create um 
you know, uh, uh, player profiles in this game where certain people are good at certain things. They really love to do things. You start to include them. And then I think, you know, there's nail it and then scale it. So nail it would be keep it as small as possible. Don't overwhelm communities. Don't come in. And especially when you do your, you know, if you're talking about who's the hero of the plot, they are. If you try to be hero of the plot, it's the protruding nail that gets the hammer, right? So, so it, it's a really, there, there's economics and there's egonomics. A lot, a lot of these um, disruptive change things are egonomics, they're ego driven. Someone's trying to take credit for something because their older brother bullied them or something. I don't know what's going on, but you got to make local heroes, the ones that won the race, the ones that repaired things, the ones that pro solved problems. Um, and that needs to be, the, the rumor mill better be spreading about how local people are in the story. Because if it's all about you, it's just a matter of time, and it should be, that, that the carrying capacity of your story is not being carried by the local porters. And so why would anybody bother? And the nice thing, what, what we're doing is, as you, as you fill these things with more lifting gas, their capability to go a lot more lift and a lot further is not complicated at all. The complication is, can you introduce it and earn respect? Don't try to command respect, try to earn respect. And then scaling involves people who help you make something bigger and make it go further. And then, you know, if, if I'm trying to build trust and I say I'm a really great person, that doesn't have a lot of validity. If somebody else says I'm a good person, it has more validity. So how many people have you engaged to tell your story? And are you testing and evaluating the story at the same time as you're testing and evaluating the technology? Because your story can block the way and your story can open the way. Thank you to both of you uh, for this very stimulating and informative um, and beautiful, inspiring talk. Um, I'm really grateful to both of you, Nat and Jay. This was very helpful, very informative, very inspiring. Um, we have, are somewhat trespassing on the participants in that um, this is the latest presentation that we've gone with, and I'm. Um, which is probably why there's um, why you're going to be viewed on video by a whole bunch of people. Some of some folks had to bail out because of the time difference and stuff. So I'm going to um, let you go, let our participants go, and thank you profusely for this presentation and what it means to this this group and you know the content and the spirit of it and what you're doing in in the world is just fantastic. Um, thank you very much. We really appreciate the time you've taken to speak to this group and what it is you've said. So um, I think that 